Welcome to KubeCon Europe 2021. My name is Mark Borstein. I'm the CTO of Tremble Security, and we are going to talk about our back. So first, I'm going to give a real brief overview of who I am uh, and why I can talk to you about our back. We'll then get into what our back can and can't do. We'll talk about some of the sharper edges around our back, where authentication comes into play and why that's important. And we'll start talking about some of the business roles of our pack, especially in multi-tenancy. Finally, we'll get into how you handle all of these concerns and a quick demo of how all this stuff comes together. So who am I? My name is Mark Borstein. Like I said, I'm the CTO of Tremo Security. I've got 20 plus years of experience in identity management. I've been working with Kubernetes since about 2016 with several contributions uh, to the project. You can often find me inside of the Slack channels talking about authentication and authorization. And finally, I just released a, a co-authored a book called Kubernetes and Docker and Enterprise Guide. So what's RBAC and what can it do? RBAC is the authorization system for the Kubernetes API. You can use it for other things. Uh, pod security policies is an example, uh, but you really shouldn't do it uh, if you don't need to. Um, there are different authorization models out there that you can use. Uh, uh, you shouldn't try and peg the RBAC API uh, outside of the Kubernetes API. Um, one of the good things, great things about it is it lets you centralize your API uh, authorization so you can define your roles globally and apply them locally inside of individual namespaces. It's a good idea across the streams to do that. Uh, one thing that's really important that you cannot do is you cannot write a policy that says, I want to do everything except X. I want to give access to everything except these four secrets in a namespace. Or I want to give cluster admin access to everything except for these three namespaces or the kube system namespace. Um, those types of policies are really difficult to implement. RBAC won't implement them for you. Uh, there are different ways that you can do that, but quite frankly, if that's your model, you probably need to reevaluate what you're doing. All right, so what makes RBAC so hard? Once we start getting into the syntax of the, the objects themselves, you'll see that they're pretty straightforward. There isn't a lot there there. Um, but there are a lot of things that give it really sharp edges. And the way I have this table broken up is I wanted to show that while some of these things uh, make it harder to get started, in the long term as you approach maintenance uh, and you know what's often called day two maintenance, um, it actually makes it a lot easier. So there's a steep learning curve, but once you get over that hump, it makes life a lot simpler. So the first is no referential integrity. Uh, if you create an RBAC policy, and, and this is true of almost anything in Kubernetes, uh, that references other objects, if those objects don't exist, Kubernetes isn't going to tell you. Um, so that can make debugging a little bit difficult. You got to be really particular in, in how you set things. Uh, users and groups, they don't exist. Uh, there are a couple of corner cases, server account, service accounts exist, and service accounts have some static groups. But in general, you can't just define an object called a group and add members to it. It doesn't exist. You can't define a user object, at least in upstream Kubernetes. OpenShift is a little bit different. Um, you can combine cluster roles and role bindings, which you know would think make things easier and does in the long run, but can often make it harder because people have a uh, in the short term because people have a, a harder time conceptualizing it. I know I did when I first got started. Uh, this one I have harder and harder. Uh, authorization is a business problem. We're going to talk a lot about this with multi-tenancy. Um, Authorization tends to follow what your the ultimate problem you're trying to solve, and a lot of the business issues around that are mission issues if you're a government agency, uh, and so that's something that that doesn't get fixed easily in technology. Uh, the APIs in Kubernetes are not self-documenting, so when you go to design your policy object, what you're going to find is that you can't look at a YAML and say, oh. That YAML tells me everything I need to know to design a policy around it. Um, and then same as what we talked about earlier with uh, not being able to write a policy that says everything except, there's very limited wildcard support. It's basically, you can either speci specify and enumerate all of what you want or a wildcard of star for everything. Uh, what you can't say is, hey, um, I want a group that applies to anything with a name that starts with generation. Um, for whatever reason. You can't do that with RBAC, and there are really good reasons for that. Uh, one of which is, um, let's say you define a, uh, a 
you deploy an operator that builds cloud objects and it just happens to have the same name as that wildcard and you didn't realize it. Well, now you've authorized access to it. Uh, so RBAC is very explicit. You have to explicitly authorize everything you want to do. Uh, and then finally, uh, this last one can directly reference users. I make this as an easier to harder. A lot of people start designing their policies where they'll start referencing users directly. Uh, this is really difficult to manage long term, especially if you have a large number of users. Uh, and so uh, I always recommend referencing groups and then store your groups inside of an identity provider. So speaking of identity providers, let's talk about authentication here for a minute. So these are the most common authentication methods. First one everybody runs into is certificate authentication. Your user is stored in the subject. Groups can be stored as OUs in the subject DN. You should not use it. Uh, Kubernetes does not support certificate revocation, which means once a certificate has been minted, it will be accepted by Kubernetes until either it expires or the certificate um, authority gets changed uh, to a different root certificate. So. Um, Break glass in case of emergency, but really it's just not dynamic enough uh, for day-to-day uh, -day use. Service account tokens should never be used from outside of the cluster. They are only ever designed to work in cluster. Um, token request API kind of changes that a little bit, but you still need a way to authenticate and get that token. So, um, and we have a link at the end about how you can do uh, uh, more secure uh, access from uh, um, outside your cluster. Now, impersonation, this is where you have a reverse proxy between your users and your API server. Reverse proxy authenticates you however it needs to, and then injects headers into the request. Uh, this is a very powerful tool, especially when you're talking about cloud-managed Kubernetes, where you don't want to use Cloud AM. Uh, OpenID Connect, this is the best way to go, to be honest. Uh, your token stores who you are, what you can do. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, your, uh, uh, can have short-lived tokens, which really adds to your security profile. And then finally, you have your cloud IAM vendors uh, or uh, implementations. Every cloud has its own implementation. And they all have different ways of managing user and group identifiers. Um, cloud IAM and impersonation are often tied to the hip because uh, this gets back to the business question. A lot of times the cloud group doesn't want to own who has access to Kubernetes. They want to just deploy it, stay out of the way, let the app owner or the team manage who has access. Um, and so uh, impersonation is a great way to do that. So let's talk about multi-tenancy. Um, there are different ways to look at multi-tenancy. Uh, these aren't, you're going to pick one or the other. It's more like you're going to have all of these, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so the first type of multi-tenancy here, which is one that's really popular these days, is this idea of having the tenant at the cluster level. So you have some kind of control plane that is responsible for provisioning clusters. And then clusters are owned by teams or individual applications. Uh, the nice thing about this approach is it limits your blast radius. So if your application would be compromised, somebody gets access to a node, they cause some problems, you're not affecting other applications. The downside to this approach is that um, it's really poor on utilization management, uh, not just hardware utilization or VM utilization, but also in resource utilization. There's a big difference between somebody who's an expert at writing applications that will run on Kubernetes and somebody who knows how to manage the nuts and bolts of Kubernetes. Those aren't, there's overlap, but they aren't the same skill sets. That's why you have different tests, right? You have a CKA and a CKAD. Um, and so uh, having a multi-cluster environment means that you have to have more people that know how to manage the individual cluster versus how to write applications for the cluster. Uh, you also need to, you haven't eliminated your boundaries in RBAC, um, you've just moved them. So maybe you're doing less work in your Kubernetes RBAC, but you've now moved the authorization layer into the control plane. Uh, pipeline tenants, so there are a lot of places, uh, implementations that will say, you know what, I don't want users interacting with the API server. I just want them checking in their code. I'm using my quotey fingers here. Um, code could be you know, application code or infrastructure as code if we're talking about GitOps. Uh, there are some implications here, though. Um, 
just like with control plane multi tenant or cluster multi tenancy, with this method, your pipelines still need a way to be multi tenant. You're, you're just moving your authorization layer from Kubernetes into your pipeline system. Uh, additionally, um, as you look at uh, how you design this out, you have to think about silos and management, especially in enterprise. The people who write the apps and who are responsible for the apps and who ultimately their paycheck is based on things like uptimes and th stuff like that are going to want as much control as possible. So if you're between them and their application when something goes wrong, you're ultimately going to get the blame for it. Uh, and so a lot of cloud teams that start with this approach make this an option, but not a requirement. Um, so something else to think about. Point out when you're looking at pipeline tenancy and using pipeline and GitOps especially, uh, is make sure you are aware of what can be provisioned into a Git repository. Um, if you are using GitOps and, for instance, you don't want people to commit uh, RBAC bindings or you don't want them to commit, um, you know, things outside the namespace, often that can't be controlled. Uh, via RBAC anymore because you're using a service account to talk to the API server through your GitOps controller, um, depending on which GitOps system you're using. So be very mindful as to the GitOps controller's controls on what can be written. And then finally, namespace multi-tenancy. And this is where you get the most richness with RBAC. Um, every application gets its own namespace or set of namespaces. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that more when we get into uh, the toolbox. Uh, authorization will be controlled by admins. So often, you know, you don't want uh, uh, you don't want system admins controlling that authorization. You want application or team admins controlling it. Uh, you get a much higher density, not just of your um, uh, resources from a, a hardware standpoint, but also from your people standpoint. You can better utilize your your cluster admins and have application admins inside of each team. Of course, the major downside to this is that if you don't have proper controls in place, you can have a larger blast radius. Somebody comes in, there's a bug in their application, leads to uh, somebody owning the node, and all of a sudden you now expose multiple applications. So um, like I said before, this isn't a, you're gonna pick one out of these three. It's, you're gonna probably end up using all three of these uh, for, for different scenarios. And that's where it gets back to um, the business rules and the business problem that authorization needs to solve being the hard part. So let's get into the guts of what RBAC actually looks like. So here we have an RBAC cluster role for certificate signing requests. And there are a couple of things to point out. I color coded this. The red stuff you don't care about. The blue stuff comes right out of your URL. So your rule comes right out of the URL definition for your cluster role. Your resource also comes out of your URL. Couple things to note. Your uh, version doesn't matter. Versions are not uh, part of RBAC. Also, if you have any uh, sub uh, URLs, any sub resources off of your resource, like in this instance, approval, pods have like logs and, and exec, um, those have to be explicitly enumerated. Picking the top level doesn't automatically inherit the bottom ones. You have to explicitly say, give me access to those. And then finally, you list your verbs. So once you have your role, you then have to bind it to subjects. Uh, and so this part, again, pretty straightforward, really. The red part doesn't really matter. That's just your metadata. Your role ref, what role are you going to reference? If this is a role binding, you can still reference a cluster role. So this way you can centralize your management of roles without having to recreate it in every single namespace. And then finally, you list your subjects. So let's talk a little bit about subjects. Three types, service accounts. So each service account has to be scoped to a specific namespace, a user, so uh, for OpenID Connect, if you're not using your email address, you have to prepend the URL of the user. And please don't use email addresses as your identifier. Names change for a lot of different reasons. Emails are tied to names. It's better to use something that will never change no matter what happens with the person's name. And finally, groups, and this is really where you want to be, um, is let the identity provider store groups. 
and then specify it by group. You'll have smaller RBAC definitions. They'll be easier to manage and so much easier to audit a directory or a database than it is to try and audit a, uh, a Kubernetes deployment. Kubernetes, you can't say, give me all the users that are a member of this RBAC policy. Um, you have to literally uh, enumerate every single policy to figure out what's going on. And if you have a large implementation, that can get difficult to do quickly. It's a good thing to cross streams. Like I said, use your cluster role from role bindings. This will allow you to better manage, uh, centrally manage your roles. Like I said, use groups. And then finally, don't use service accounts from outside your cluster. All right, so we're going to go through a few tools here that will make it easier for you to um, uh, uh, manage RBAC. So the first one is this idea of an aggregate role. So if you look at the admin or editor uh, cluster roles, you'll see these giant roles that have um, access to almost everything. So like the admin cluster role is designed to let somebody own a namespace without affecting anybody else in the cluster. So you can, you know, change R back, you can create uh, uh, um, secrets and, and, and config maps and pods and whatnot, uh, but you can't say create a resource quota uh, because that would affect everybody else. And so to build that role, you could either have this big giant static role or what the Kubernetes API server does is it lets you aggregate additional permissions in. So instead of having this one big giant static role that as new objects get created, you have to update, you create another cluster role and you add these labels to it, like aggregate to admin, and the um, role aggregator says, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and add those to the admin cluster role. So if you're defining a... Um, uh, you're defining like a custom resource for an operator to deploy things into your cloud. Instead of having to uh, define a cluster role and assign it to everybody, you add this label to the cluster role and anybody who's an admin will be able to create that object. So number two in your toolbox, automation. Um, everything's API driven, right? So you want to be able to automate, automate, automate. So whatever's repetitive, go ahead, automate it. This gives you the ability to have naming standards. Lots of tools to do this. Open Unison, our open source project, is what I'm going to show in the demo. But Terraform, uh, continuous delivery tools, do it yourself. There, there's no end of ways that you can automate this. And so you can see here, we've got three namespaces. Each namespace gets a couple of role bindings. It goes to groups. And everything is consistent, and it's much easier to manage. And you as a human are not building this stuff. Custom controllers. So we talked about the role aggregator. Another one that I really like is the Fairwinds RBAC manager. So instead of having to have that repetitive role binding in every single namespace uh, and having this proliferation of groups, you get to have a um, single object that defines a label and says a namespace with this label gets this role binding. And so now you can have like a team-based approach where different namespaces get team labels and then the custom controller automatically generates your bindings for you. So this makes it a lot simpler to manage, cuts down on the repetitive um, objects you need to create and is much more expressive. Uh, we're gonna use Fairwinds RBAC Manager, which is a great tool for this, but hierarchical namespaces are another way to solve the same problem by having um, a, a team-based approach. And then finally, policy generation. Um, Audit to RBAC is a great tool written by Jordan Liggett. When you get your error messages, they don't give you enough information. Uh, you need to be able to get something that's machine readable uh, to, to do it. Uh, so if you look at the event, you can see this comes right out of the event log. You can see the verb that was created, the request API, um, what was actually requested, uh, and the user and groups that were requested to do it. So um, this gives you enough information. Uh, so always enable your audit API. You wanna try something, you see that fails, tell this tool to go look at your logs, it'll generate a policy for you. I use it all the time, it's a great system. All right, so let's talk about the demo real quick here. Um, we're gonna go with the team-based multi-tenancy approach. I see this a lot, where each team can have multiple namespaces. 
sysadmins don't want to be in the job of creating those namespaces or adding access to those teams. So each team is going to get its own admin and view group. And then uh, once the team gets created, admins inside of that team are then able to create namespaces for their team. Somebody wants access, they get access to the team, they then automatically have access to everything else. So how does that get implemented? Well, Open Unison is going to do the automation. So an admin is going to go in and request to create a team. That will create groups inside of a database. It will create an RBAC definition for Fairwinds to be able to run off of. And then when they create namespaces, each namespace will get a label for that team. And then the Fairwinds RBAC manager will go ahead and generate the RBAC binding. So let's go ahead and log in here. So I'm going to first log in as an admin. And then I'm also going to log in as a non-privileged user. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a new team. So we're going to call this demo three. Now that we've created our team, we're going to go ahead and approve the team's creation. And once confirmed, we're going to go ahead and go over to the dashboard, give this a quick refresh, and we'll see that we now have two RBAC definitions, one for demo admin and one for demo view. And if we take a quick look, we'll see that it's bound to a group. That group exists inside of our database now, and it's going to match any namespace with the label team demo three. So as an admin, I'm now going to go ahead and log in, and let's create a couple of namespaces. So local deployment, we're going to create it for team demo three, uh, and we're going to call this uh, U1. And let's create another one. That team U2. And then finally, U3. All right, so those objects have been created. And I'm going to go into the Kubernetes dashboard here as my regular user. And we'll see that we have a bunch of the namespaces have already been created, but I don't have access to them. It's forbidden. So let's go ahead and request access. So I'm going to come over here, and I want to be an administrator. And you can see that we now have demo three in here. So I'm going to add it to my cart. New dev. Submit the request. So the team admin now gets an email, says, hey, you got an open request. Go ahead and approve it. So it's all done without having to create any kube control. So I'm going to approve the request. And if I come over here, I go to our reports. This is where it becomes so important to be able to externalize your group memberships. You can see here that we can now run reports against the database. We don't have to go against the, um, uh, uh, the API server to see who has access to what. The groups are stored right in the database. So I'm going to go ahead and log out of Jay Jackson and log back in. Wrong user. So let's log in as Jen Jackson. And let's go into the dashboard. Oh. There we go. And so now if I go to EU2, I now have access. I'm able to get in, I'm able to see pods and secrets and config maps, and am I in the right one? No, I'm not. Demo three, or oops, U2, there we go. So we can see there's the kube root CA cert, secrets, all there. Now, here's the great thing about the uh, use of Teams. Let's say for some reason, we need to cut off access immediately from this namespace from all developers. 
So I'm going to come in here and I'm going as an admin, I'm going to go into namespaces. I'm going to go to EU2. I'm going to edit this and I'm going to remove this label. So within a moment, what we're going to find, you can see it happened in real time right there. I no longer have access to that team because Fairwind's RBAC manager removed the role binding because I changed the downstream object. This works great also if you're doing RBAC or, or I'm sorry, um, GitOps where you're checking this object in. Uh, let, let the controller do the work for you. So some resources here, um, some links to a couple of articles I've written on some topics we've talked about. The demo for the source code will be available by the time that you see this in May. Uh, and so if you want to take a look at that demo and how we put it together, uh, or even get it running on your own, of course, Fairwind's our back manager, great tool, highly recommended. And then finally, some shameless self-promotion. Um, Go ahead and say hi to me on Twitter at MLBIAM. Uh, if you want to take a look at Open Unison, here's a link to our website. And if you're interested in the book, a uh, link to that on Amazon. Finally, if you want to roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty on um, RBAC and authentication and pod security policies, we put together a lab that you can just download, do it yourself. You just need Active Directory uh, VM, excuse me, and um, an Ubuntu VM and uh, we'll help you deploy everything. It's all right there in GitHub. Thanks and uh, have a great day.